So sometimes in, in ecology we talk about the biodiversity crisis and this is because we're losing species like we've never seen before. Now over the years, you know, if we go back millions and millions of years, there have been times when a large proportion of the biodiversity on the planet has gone extinct. Like this happened, you know, when the, when the meteorite came and, and hit the earth and changed the climate and, you, and, and eventually you ended up with the dinosaurs all going extinct. There's others where we've lost, you know, 70 to 80 percent of all of the diversity on the planet. So this has happened before, but this is over periods of millions of years and then it recovers and you come back up to a large number of species on the planet. And that's happened multiple times. Right now, though, we're currently call this the biodiversity crisis because the speed at which we're losing species has never been seen before on the planet. I mean, just in the last two or three hundred years, the number of species that we are losing um, compared to other times is unheard of. So what is it that's causing this? Well, f not entirely, but for sure, humans have a, have a large um, role to play. And this is why it's broader and faster than any past extinctions. And now we don't know the full crisis, the full scale of this yet, but there's enough signs to know that the biosphere is probably in big trouble. So the three main causes of this biodiversity crisis are number one, habitat destruction. Uh, this is by far the, the biggest single threat to biodiversity. Number two, introduced species. So when you have exotic species that are sometimes introduced into new areas, they tend, sometimes they tend to outcompete all of the, the species that live there and you have this change in the entire community structure. A good example of this are the Nile perch or even here close to where I live in Utah, we have this lake called Utah Lake and the carp in Utah Lake have really changed the structure of this lake. The third reason is overexploitation, where the resource, a particular resource, is overexploited because it's it's you know too much fishing or too much uh, logging or whatever it is that happens in too much. Why are we concerned about this? Well, because we rely on biodiversity for lots of different things, for food, clothing, and shelter, oxygen, and, and as we lose biodiversity, we may limit the potential to have new discoveries in food or medicine. So this is reflecting a large scale in the biosphere and these could have catastrophic consequences and this is why we're concerned about this. So in the community we can also look at the trophic levels of a food chain. So we can look at things like the producers, the plants and the phytoplankton, the primary consumers, the secondary consumers and tertiary consumers and you've heard of this before where we talk about food chains. We even should remember that the detritivores or decomposers are also an important part because they recycle the energy from the dead material that's left over at all trophic levels. But in reality, food chains are much more complicated and what they really are are what we call food webs, where you have the, the producers and primaries and secondaries, but some organisms can be both secondary and primary. Some organisms eat both plant and animal life. And so this becomes a much more woven complex um, of different food chains coming into this big huge food web. In fact, if you look at just the food web of seals, um, they, they eat cod and then you know this is like the simple way where you just say okay here's the food chain everything else cod seals. In reality it's something more like this where cod here is at the middle and here are all of the different species that are interacting with cod. So as organisms are eating and going through this food chain the energy is being used, but not very efficiently, surprisingly. In fact, if you take this caterpillar and say, okay, it eats a bunch of leaves and it gets 100 kilocalories, 50% of that is basically going off right through its body and coming out with its fecal material. Another 35% is being used just for it to be able to move and chew and do everything it needs to do while it's eating. Only about 15, 10 to 15% actually goes towards growth. So when you look across an, uh, a diagram like this called an energy pyramid diagram where we look at the producers, primary consumers, secondary and tertiary, you see that from a field that has a potential of 10,000 kilocalories, the grasshoppers come in and they only can transfer about 10% of that into their bodies that, that, that is then available as a, um, as a primary consumer. So now you've cut this down to 1,000 kilocalories. Then the mice come in and eat the grasshoppers and, and basically you have another transference of about only 10%. So now there's 100 kilocalories and then you have the snakes that come in and they eat the, the mice and there's now 10 kilocalories available. And this is why you don't ever see, you know, fifth level, sixth level, seventh level consumers. There's just not enough energy to go around. So it would be actually, there are some really good ecological arguments for eating more vegetables and plant material than 
um, animal material. For example, you could feed this many humans on this same plot of corn instead of taking that same plot of corn, making cow feed, giving it to the cows, and then having humans eat the cows, right? You could only feed this many humans. Now, each of these communities also, different communities have different um, ways of, of creating organic mass. And we call that biomass. In fact, the most productive areas on the planet can be looked at in different ways. One way, first of all, is to look at the percentage of Earth's surface. So most of Earth is op open ocean, right? That's most of what Earth is, and then you have different areas that we can classify that are the land. But if you look at the average net primary productivity, right, places like algal beds and, and the rainforests are the most productive areas in the world on just grams per meter squared per year. But if you put both the first graph and the second graph together into the percentage of Earth's net primary productivity, of course the ocean, open ocean, is still very productive. That's because it's so huge. But look at the, what the next most important one is, the tropical rainforest. And that's why that has really become the poster child of much of this environmental um, movement. Well, the climate can affect then the way that these biomes are, are, are made up and distributed. So if you look at the Earth, it's curved, of course, and the sunlight, when it comes in, if it hits directly, right, like near the equator, it's only spread out this much, and so it's very concentrated, and so you get higher temperatures. But as you move towards the poles, you get the sunlight that comes in at a lower angle, and so it's essentially spread out, and so it doesn't heat up the Earth as much as it does at the equator. So at the equator, you get most of your heat that then is making the, um, at the moisture um, come up into the air and forming clouds. And so that's also where you get a lot of your rain is around the tropics. As you move towards the poles, you get areas that are drier because you don't have as much water in the atmosphere anymore, and the temperature goes um, down. So when you look across also the Earth, it's not flat, right? There are mountains and other, and other features. And so when you, know, you get a cloud moving across a coastal range, some of the rainfall happens there. And then it moves a little bit further, and then you get even more rainfall. This is like the, you know, the, the coastal range in California and then the Sierra Nevadas. By the time that those clouds get over the Sierra Nevadas, they've lost most of their water. And so you get this huge shadow, this rain shadow, that creates um, these semi-deserts, kind of like the Great Basin. And so if you combine both the, the effect of the equator to the poles and then these land formations, mountains, you can see that this is what makes up all of the different biomes across the planet. And here is a graph showing all of the main biomes, right? And if you look, well, where is the tundra in Arctic? Well, of course, that's up at the poles. But look at the other areas of the world that also are tundra, classified as, as tundra and arctic. Well, it's high elevation, right, on the mountaintops. And where are the places that are tropical forest? Well, we would expect it to be around the equator, and that's exactly where it is. But it's not all of the equator, right? There are areas in the Africa here, inland, very inland, where you now don't have much rainfall anymore. We're now going to talk about the different, uh, some of the different cycles, right? So this is now the ecosphere where we're looking now at all of the different abiotic factors and, and biotic factors together. So, you know, you've maybe heard of the carbon cycle before where carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere, it's taken in by the plants, remember, through the process of photosynthesis, then those are eaten by primary and secondary consumers and so forth, and as they are functioning, they're going through cellular respiration and they whew, exhale, and what do they exhale? CO2, and that goes back into the atmosphere. Um, and eventually they die, and as they die, the detritivores break them down, and that also breaks down and more CO2 into the atmosphere. But also, whenever you take a piece of wood and you burn it, it be that gets transferred, all of that mass gets transferred into the atmosphere in the form of CO2. And so since wood and fossil fuels have really started to change things in the last two or three hundred years, you've seen this extra input of CO2 into the atmosphere that we didn't have happening before. And this has led to climate change. One of the most important things is global warming. So if you look at this graph where we have the concentration of CO2 in the black line and the temperature variation in the red line, you see this nice correlation that at, over the, this graph is just showing from 1960 and on, but you can actually find um, other graphs, and I'll have some links to those on the, on the website, where you can 
look at graphs that even go back way further than this, and the correlation is still there, that as the concentration of CO2 has increased, the temperature has also increased. Now be careful about sometimes listening to different talking points on this, because what I've found is that someone who wants to prove a point can choose any two data points on a graph to make their point. For example, if I were to say, well, temperature from 1997 to 2005 actually went down. Well, that's true. If you take just the data point 1997 and go to 2005, it did go down. But that's not the trend. The trend is that it has been going up. I mean, I could also, I would be just as critical if someone said, well, from 1985 to 1990, it went up, you know, this much. Well, yeah, but you can't choose just, you can't pick and choose your data points. This is why it's important to learn how to, to interpret um, graphs, especially when you're looking at some of these issues that become controversial. And so I always suggest look at the literature, look at the graphs, look at the data, and then make your decisions about where you stand on these issues. What we do know is that as CO2 increases, there is an explanation for the increase in temperature, and this is called the greenhouse effect. With more CO2 in the atmosphere, the heat that comes down from the light of the sun is trapped essentially. It's kind of like a greenhouse. And so you get more heat being trapped into the atmosphere. And so if we don't remove that CO2, it continues to trap the heat and you see the increased temperatures, which, is de which has been demonstrated by the data that has been collected. This is a more specific, more co a complex graph that I pulled from a report from a bunch of different scientists and policymakers that all come together. They do this every so often um, to look at climate change. And what they are able to conclude is that the warming that has occurred is not just natural. The t this, this graph down here, this is the total. The total net anthropogenic effect, or in other words, the total human effect, is, par is partially responsible for the increased temperature change. Some of the, and the biggest culprit of this is CO2, but there's also CH4s. There's even some things that humans do that do a cooling, a, a kind of a cooling of the planet, like aerosols. But aerosols have a different issue with the ozone. So, um, but overall, the human effect is changing the climate. So some of the consequences of climate change and global warming, well, things like glaciers. Um, are melting and so you have sea levels that are rising. Weather patterns are changing. This may have some effects on the health and the food and even the mortality in certain areas. It's changing ecosystems and the wildlife can live there. It's changing the chemistry of the ocean. It's definitely changing things. Some people say, well, is this a big deal? Well, let's look at this. If you look at the data from 1880 up to about 2005, you see also there is this trend that sea levels are rising. But look over at the um, at the range here. What are we talking about? We're talking about 20 centimeters in that time period. Is that a big deal? Well, it's, maybe it's not a big deal to me in Utah because I don't live by the coast, but if I live in Amsterdam or if I live in Louisiana or uh, some other low-lying country, if I live on an island that basically has no elevation to it whatsoever, this starts to become a big deal. And if you project out what's going to continue to happen. These are all of the basic models that show what's going to happen. Some of them get up to, by the year 2100, that we might have almost a meter rise in sea levels, three feet, right? That's, that's a huge difference for some areas of the world. So this could be a huge problem, right? And there's, there's also this, this cyclical, as you get more and more melting of glaciers, that kind of, it feeds the process, and, and then they start to melt even faster. And, so this is a, of, of major concern. I, I don't want to spend more time on this, but I highly suggest this is something that you look into and study more and more. But the scientific consensus is that climate change is happening, global warming is happening, sea levels are rising, and that humans have something to do with this. Now, where this is going to lead in the future and can we change this, that's what we don't know. We're still hopefully going to keep looking at that. But I always say if, we, if there's a chance that we can change it, let's do something to change it. So think about that, study on this, look at the data, and then make sure that you make informed decisions in the future.